ready? I'd like to order, order, order for a moment. Okay, I'd like to call this Flint City Council meeting to order. I'd ask Councilman Freeman to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Please all rise. Madam Clerk, would you um, please do roll call? Ms. Poplar? Present. Mr. Nolden? Present. Mr. Freeman? Present. Mr. Lawler? Present. Mr. Neely? Here. Mr. Wayhill? Here. Mr. Sargentson? Here. Mr. Kincaid? Here. Is there any special order or unfinished business, Madam Clerk? No, Mr. President. Okay. Madam Clerk, is there any additional communications to be placed on file? No, not at this time. Okay. Now's the time set aside for the audience to address the Flint City Council. We have a number of speakers here this evening. I've been uh, pretty liberal in the past in giving uh, individuals extra time, but because we have so many speakers here and everybody wants to have the opportunity to speak, I'm going to make sure that you uh, please limit your comments to five minutes. We will notify you when your five minutes are up. Uh, council Rule 27.5, any person being heard at the City Council meeting may be called to order by myself or any of my colleagues. Council Rule 27.7, any person who is called to order shall thereupon take his or her seat. I'm just going to ask you to wait until there's a determination so that we can move the meeting forward. I will let you know that um, you're to be germane and no personal attacks on individuals or institutions, and again, give you your five minutes, and if you do not um, um, follow the five-minute rule, um, we will ask um, for you to set, take your seat. And if you don't take your seat, we're going to ask to have you move, removed from the council chambers. And that's because we have so many speakers this evening, and I want everybody to have the opportunity so that everybody can hear um, what those individual uh, speakers have to say. First to be called this evening, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Jacqueline Popola. Thank you, Mr. President, and to my council members. I come here this evening not representing Jackie Poplar. I'm representing the city of Flint. I'm representing my constituents that have been put under chains. That's what I represent this evening. And this bondage must stop. This bondage must stop. I quote from the Flint Journal, yesterday's newspaper. Mr. Brown is saying, Mr. Kurtz has the power as emergency financial manager to decide the cash-strapped city would not spend money on resources on a council investigation hearing. But on the other hand, Mr. Brown sold the same cash-strapped city's towers, better known as Genesee Towers, for one dollar. What planet, Mr. Brown, are you living on? What planet are you living on? That belongs to the constituents that live in this city. Mr. Brown has not paid not one dime, neither has Mr. Kurtz for that building. But I paid, you paid, and these people out here paid. That's who paid. By the way, 
It is, and they must know this, the people's building. They paid for it, not the two overseers of this community that was sent here by Almighty Pharaoh, Mr. Snyder, Snyder, whatever he's calling his name for the state of Michigan. And I'm keeping it real, because that's what's going on, OK? Mr. Kurtz issued a directive that council has no authority to issue referrals as to how Mr. Brown and Mr. Kurtz spends the city's money, the people's money. We can't even question them on how the money was spent. Well, you know what? I didn't particularly care for Mr. Williams, but one thing I have to give it to him, he did allow us to have an investigative hearing, even though it was ugly. He allowed us to have this. But these two and council, whatever we have to do, and we have to take it to the sidewalks and subpoena them to the sidewalks, they got to come. And somehow, we got to make them come. We are no joke. We are human beings. We are spending our hard-earned money. And it's hurting me. It's hurting them. And I'm sure some of you are being hurt. And I'm sick and tired of being hurt by pharaohs. But one thing I do know, and the Bible says, it's woe on the leaders that bring atrocities on the least of these. So if it don't come to Mr. Kurtz and it don't come to Mr. Brown, it's coming to the people that are in their generations. And it can roll on from one generation all the way to 10 generations. So they must know this. Council, we got to stand up. And whatever we need to do, we got to stand up. Because these two fell. Thank you, Jackie. Co Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening, Madam Clerk. Mr. Ray Neal. Mr. Raymond Neal. Mr. Neal? Yes. It's your time to speak. And thank you for coming this evening. Thank, thank you, Council, for accepting me here. I want to elaborate somewhat on what Council Commissioner Jack Cropper said. I'm a member of the Fifth Park. Pull your mic down. Just pull your mic down just a little bit so the audience can hear you. There you go. Thank you. All right. I want to elaborate a little bit on what she said. I'm a member. Well, I was a member of the Fifth Park Lake Citizen District Council. I'm reading the paper, and all of a sudden, we are disbanded. No explanation, no reason, no nothing. We have been in service for at least 10 years or so. The city is saying, help us. Let's stop crying. Let's stop doing this. This is what we've been doing. The city don't pay for no nothing. They don't rent from the city. They don't pay for our rent or water or food. We eat or nothing. We do this as a service to the city. <clears throat> and I would like to know why it was done. That's not costing the city anything, but we are helping the city. The city is benefiting from everything that we do. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming this evening. <clears throat> Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Robert Young. Mr. Young. Robert Young. Yes, my name is uh, Robert Young. I called the city about uh, I say about two weeks ago, my address is uh, 4617 Edwards Avenue. 
And the reason I call the city of plenty is because I got pedophiles that's living on my left. I got pedophiles that's living in front of me. Now, I called about a, a house that's on the corner of um, my address is 4617 Edwards Avenue. Now the house that sits on the corner is on Baltimore and Edwards Avenue. Now, we got, I got pedophiles and no telling what else. Now, I call about the house being boarded up. It's not boarded up. Now, you got kids on, you got kids on that street, up and down the street, kids going in that house that's on the corner, it's not boarded up. Now, I can see the pedophiles on my bedroom side, but once they go on the other side, you can't see them. So that house needs to be boarded up or tore down. Now, my other gripe is about, you, you want to raise my, uh, my water bill, which then jumped up to $140. Now, uh, instead of you raising my water bill, you need to be putting more police officers out on the street. You understand that? You need to put them out on the street. And uh, I, I, have one, I have one more thing to say. You need to take this city hall and tear it down and build it ground up. Because in my mind, all of you are nothing but a bunch of crooks. All of you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. The next speaker is Miss Carolyn Shannon. Miss Carolyn Shannon. To the Honorable Council, to the Honorable President Scott Kincaid, to the Honorable City Clerk Inez Brown. I'm here today to let you know that I woke up, I'm standing up, and I'm asking you to get up for Flint. You cannot let Republicans tell you what to do. Ever since I was a little girl, I was taught by some very good people to be a Democrat. And as long as I've been in the city of Flint, I've been a Democrat. And I'm asking you to stand up for democracy because we have lost that in this city. We cannot have anyone coming in this city taking money out of our pockets, putting it in their pockets. I'm going to say it again. Chief Alvern Lott does not need someone babysitting him. He doesn't need a nanny. He knows what he's doing. Take that $135,000 and put one more policeman on the streets and one more fire department. It, everything that happens here is elementary. I'm telling you, the checks and balances, you should fight for that right to check somebody. Check anybody that will take money out of your pocket and put it in their pocket. Why should anyone get $14,000 a month and you get $7,000 for your job. I'm asking you to fight for your salaries back. We do not want carpetbaggers to come in the city of Flint, pay taxes somewhere else. When they fill up their tank, they fill it up in another city. When they eat out at restaurants, they eat out in another city. They just come here 
for the reason of Snyder. He is not good for the state of Michigan. He's not good for people like you and me. He's only good for the rich. These people are getting paid, but are you, are any of the people you know getting paid? We already had an administrator, Mr. Eason. Why would Mr. Eason be replaced without an investigation? It should be an investigation. He should be put back on his job. And the mayor, I work for him from dawn to dust. And I'm asking him to step up the plate, put his administration administrator back in place. If something is wrong with the administrator, he should not be the fall guy. And it's a lot of people shouldn't be the fall guy for, for this administration. We've got very good people here in the city of Flint, and it's time for us to step up to the plate with our courage, with our strength, with our perseverance, with our love of the city. And I appreciate it. If you get a steering committee, the master plan for McCree Theater, I think we deserve a state-of-the-art building across from Do Doyle Ryder, and I will keep saying that until you give me the deeds so I can give the deed to Mr. Charles Winfrey. It is high time. My children went to McCree Theater. They're all adults. One of my daughters could sing, the other one couldn't. Mr. Winfrey said, you step in the back. That's because she couldn't sing. He said, don't say nothing. She remembers that. So I'm saying that McCree has been in the existence for over 30 years, and I'm asking you, Dane Walling told me and Mrs. Willie James that we, if we didn't own that space, the across from Doyle Ryder on South Saginaw and Chippewa, we want the back side, the Chippewa side, and the front. Ms. Shannon, your five minutes are up. Thank you very much. Thank we you. deserve a deed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. A.C. Dumas. Mr. Dumas. A.C., <laughs> just a second. Councilman Freeman, could you open that other door in the back? The doors need to be open. Well, it won't stay open? Well, we could put a chair there, I think. Okay. I'm sorry, A.C. <clears throat> My name is A.C. Dumas, and I take note that the... Uh, See, the attorney left out, I gave him a document and let him know that I would be speaking to him along with the city council. Uh, Michigan GOP, that's the grand old party. AG Schutte, Resurrect Zombie Emergency Manager Law, PA 72, using uh, not forthright logic. And that word zombie means dead. It states, this is the law. Whenever a statute or any part thereof shall be repealed by a subsequent statute, such statute or any part thereof so repealed shall not be re revived by the repeal of the subsequent repealing statute. That's what you were saying. Other words, when four came in, 72 was dead. Gone. Not like Jesus rise again. It's gone. Wait just a minute. So we have this big argument, a question between the Chief Justice Robert Young Jr. of the Michigan Supreme Court. Now I'm going to read this. There's one issue that is uh, receded importance. Perhaps is the very important uh, issue. But one of the sign claims of deficiency is that the petitions, and this was talking about the, when we took the four petitions, 
Public Act 4 to the uh, uh, Supreme Court to see if it's going to go on the ballot. So this is a few, few weeks ago. It said, it is asserted that the effect of the referendum will cause the prior law to spring into effect. Are you familiar with this? And he's talking to the representative, the attorney for citizens for fiscal responsibility. And John Pritch said, I am. Justice Young said, and do you have a position? I read, now listen to this, I read the attorney general's position that said that this law was suspended, that the prior law would go into effect and we would provide a copy of the document to the court. Justice Young, I'm asking you about the statute. See how he, he's veering away. Justice Young, yes, I understand the statute. I'm reading real fast. Justice Young, the statute says whenever a statute or a part thereof is repealed by subsequent statute, such statute or any part thereof so repealed shall not be revived by repeal of such subsequent statute. That means it's dead. Let, let me get to the good part. And, and JP, that's the, uh, that's the other guy. And I think it's a question. Wait. And I think it's a question that does not uh, face this court. In other words, he told the justice, that ain't before you. What's before you is if Public Act 4 is going on the ballot or not. Now, what arrogance are you telling the chief justice? of the Michigan Supreme Court, who happens to be a Republican, to tell him it ain't before you. Ms. Ms. Brown, timeouts don't count. You, you know, in baseball, football, you call timeout the, the clock, quit running. So timeouts don't, that was a timeout. Justice Young, well, we're not even dealing with a repeal. If this measure goes on the ballot, it merely suspends the emergency manage your law, not repeal it. That is correct. Justice Young, okay? He's leading them into a trap, but he ain't smart enough to see it. Okay, so what's the theory then of reviving the law? Is it not dead? The emergency manager isn't dead until the people choose uh, to take it out. So how does the effect of the Repeal create, created by the emergency fat, uh, manager law affect the repeal of the prior law. Well, if the law is enacted and repeals, oh my goodness. Anybody gonna give me I, their I time? I like to give him two minutes. I like, I I like to give him two minutes. Go, go ahead. I like to have two minutes. AC, please, please sum up because I think this, I'm is, sum up. I'm, I'm this sum is important up. because this is the position that the city council has taken. All right, thank you, the sir. Public Act 72 is not in effect. The law is dead. Okay, uh, John uh, Preach, well, if the law is enacted and repeals the prior law, but then the law is no longer effective. It is our contention. This is what Justice Young said. It's suspended. It is dead. Now, this is, this is the Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice, telling them, well, let me finish up. Let me wrap up. Thank you. In the, church, in the Baptist church, they get about four or five wrap-ups. In Church of God in Christ, we get, <laughs> let me close if you please. We get about 10. So, let me close if you please. That's the Church of God in Christ. Come on, AC. OK, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Justice Young, Justice Young stated it's been repealed. However, the AG, and, and this, this is what he says, the AG is convinced that Public Act 72 is the law of the land, which until now has been repealed and needs to be voted on. It is my opinion that the law is dead and should not be, and should not be revived and cannot walk again on the face of this earth. This is from the justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, the chief justice. And so I asked what can be done? Go to court, go to circuit court, challenge the AG, because it's just opinion, it's his interpretation. Until it be challenged, it is the law. But once you challenge it, and it's kicked out because no judge gonna rule over what the Michigan Supreme Court have already ruled. 
Thank you. Thank you, AC. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Eric Mays. Mr. Eric Mays. This, is, this, this was a setup because politics makes strange bedfellows. And I'm here to tell you, I called A.C. Dubas this weekend and we made sure that we bought us some time. He was going to speak and I'm going to piggyback on it. And I know behind me, I heard a man, he's a pastor, he's already told y'all this a meeting or two ago, Latrell Holmes, Pastor Holmes probably speak behind me. It's a setup because we're trying to get y'all to see something. Pastor Stewart is in the room. I see other pastors. <laughs> Mount Pisgah and their pastor, House of Prayer. See, Pastor Stewart teased me. He, he, he talked like this sometimes. And, and, and he was at, he was at Foss Avenue praying the other day with us. And Pastor Flynn ain't here, but the community didn't come together. Jackie Poplar, I called her for the first time in my life today. She did a good job with them chains. And, 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 and Pastor Stewart, you know, Pastor Williams said, when you speak, sometimes you have to make it plain and keep it simple. What Dumas read was some legalities. What I'm supposed to do, what Dumas and I talked about, is following up and make it plain. What Dumas is saying is this. Pastor Holmes said it two meetings ago. He said the last page of Public Act 4 repealed Public Act 72. In other words, Ed Kurtz is appointed right now in this city hall under Public Act 72. Now, don't get it wrong. You know, me and Neely is at Shiloh. We think that's the greatest church in the city of Flint on the corner of Leith and McClellan. <laughs> but the point is, we talk all the time. I talked to Scott Kincaid today. I talked to Brian Nolan, and I talked to Sergeant. And we all believe that Ed Kurtz is illegally appointed in the city of Flint. We believe that if Ed Kurtz was illegally appointed right now as the emergency manager, he could not appoint Mike Brown as city administrator. In other words, what Dumas read is saying to us in plain language that the minute that we go over to circuit court and talk to Archie Heyman or Judge Ewell or Nethercutt that the city council and mayor will be back in power. I mean, that's what we believe. And so we fixing to start drawing up a lawsuit to get them over there in the next day or two. And, and we believe when the city attorney who was in on it, I'm going to tell you, Pastor, the city attorney and Tim Herman, them, they was the ones who was the original plaintiffs, thanks to Neely telling us, they was the original plaintiffs in the lawsuit against Genesee Towers. So in other words, what we're saying is he can't sit here. He can't, he, he can't get legal advice, and he's saying, uh, with Kurtz and them, we won't help y'all get us out of here. But what we're saying is this. We got a lot of attorney friends, and we know how to draw up lawsuits on notebook paper, whether they help us or not. So in the next two days or so, you'll see us move from City Hall to Circuit Court.
And, and, and Pastor, I mean, I know God is in the middle of this because look how many people God done brought to city council and I'm telling you they fitting to move over to the circuit court. And, 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 and I believe that the state of Michigan from Ben Harbor to Pontiac to Highland Park to Detroit is going to look at Flint and how we dealt legally with these emergency managers in here trying to take our voting rights and democracy. So Flint, Flint is on the move for getting our democracy back. But then when we do, when we do, when we do, I hope that the pastors will continue to be involved because the council and the mayor are going to need some help. Eric, Eric, come on. I'm summing up, and I want the people to know that, believe me in my heart, when I talk to Pastor Randolph and I talk to Pastor Flynn and even when Pastor Stewart teased me like this and Mount Pesca Pastor, we go back to truck and bus, we know how to put people to work. We know how to create jobs. We know how to get some cash flowing. And I'm here to tell you, all we got to do is be prayerful, hang on, and we will provide the leadership in the city of Flint to fix some stuff. The minute that we take power, they can repeal water rates. They can put police on the street, and we can create jobs. We're going to do it with bottled water like Amway. Checks will flow. God bless. Mr. President. Th thank you, Eric. Mr. Mr. President, I think, Neely. I think it's appropriate time to go ahead and, and add this resolution. This is going to be add on number one, and I think Ines has a copy there. I had to make some amendments on this, but this resolution, I'll read it, and we have to type up uh, the corrections on this resolution. But in light of the two speakers and the will of this body and the will of the people, this, res this resolution is appropriate at this time, and I'll read it to you. Resolution to seek, in seek injunctive relief of the emergency financial manager. Whereas on August 8, 2012, the Emergency Financial Assistance Loan Board appointed an emergency financial manager to the city of Flint pursuant to PA 72 of 1990, and now therefore be it resolved that the Flint City Council shall, shall, seek, excuse me, shall seek injunctive relief in the appropriate court to stay the appointment of the emergency financial manager. I move that resolution. Support. Support. It's been moved and supported. Discussion? Roll, Madam Clerk. Ms. Poplar? Yes. Mr. Nolan? Yes. Mr. Freeman? Is he right here? Yes. Mr. Lawler? Yes. Mr. Neely? Yes. Mr. Wayhill? Yes. Mr. Sargentson? Yes. Mr. Kincaid? Yes. The, the vote is seven yes, zero no. Thank you, Councilman Neely. <clears throat> Thank you. Our, our next speaker this evening, Madam Clerk. Pastor Latrell Holmes. Greetings, City Council. It's good to see you all sitting in the place that you desire to be and that you should be. I want to just congratulate you on that last resolution uh, because that's the right thing to do. The law that was given the interpretation by Attorney General Shooter is Michigan Pile Law 8.4A. In that law, as Mr. Dumas rightfully communicated to you all, it says that any law that's on the book that's been repealed should not be reenacted. If you read the Attorney General's opinion, there is no legal definition in the state of Michigan for that word repeal. And so he looked back at Webster's unabridged dictionary copyrighted in 1962. <laughs> And he defined the word that basis said, whatever act of the legislature 
act on and they pull back, or in his words, that they kill is dead. So I encourage you tonight to, to proceed on with that action because we came down here tonight. We came down here tonight on the heels of what we expressed on Saturday morning at the Krim in front of hundreds of thousands of people that the city of Flint has had enough. We've had enough. We came tonight with the express intent to sleep. Hold up your pillows. We came here to sleep in City Hall tonight. And the only reason we're not going to sleep tonight is because the emergency financial manager who has been appointed wrongly had the good sense to give you back access to the hall that belongs to the people of the city of Flint. And so we want you to stand with us. It's been asked with the clergy stand. I'd ask every pastor that's here to stand up right now. Yes, we stand. And then I want the people to stand up tonight. Have up the people stand. Yes, we gonna stand with you tonight. We gonna stand with you tonight. We gonna stand with you next Monday. We gonna stand with you all the way through the repeal of this ridiculous act because wrong is wrong. The only thing wrong with those chains that she brought down here tonight is they don't extend far enough. Because those chains need to fall from all of us, and they gonna fall in November. They gonna fall in November. They gonna fall in November. Thank, thank you, Pastor Holmes. Our next speaker this evening, Madam Clerk. The next speaker is Ms. Naira Sharif. Ms. Sharif. My name is Naira Sharif, and I came down here fully prepared to sit down and sleep in down here at Flint City Hall. I can't tell you why everyone else decided to come on down here. I can only tell you why I, de why I decided to come on down. Um, Ed Kurtz's decision to ban Flint City Council from using city resources to conduct an investigative hearing is the latest affront to our access to democracy. This decision is no better or no worse than prior decisions made by emergency manager Michael Brown, but this may be the decision that will incite outrage from the community. Even the reasoning that Kurtz gave that the city is in a deficit is laughable at best. I have some critical questions for Ed Kurtz. I wish he was here so he could answer those questions. So number one, where was this fiscal responsibility when Mike Brown entered into contracts worth nearly $100 million or $1 million in staff? Number two, where was the financial stewardship when Genesee Towers was sold for $1? Number three, where was this idea to create financially sound decisions when Mike Brown was brought in as a city administrator making the same amount that he did as emergency manager? It seems to me that this unequal application is only imposed when the outcome will benefit the people. Public Act 4 lies at the center of this theft of our democratic rights this corporate and special interest shakedown to separate the people from our public assets. Never in the recorded history has given up democracy been the currency for financial stability. The only way, the only way that we can overthrow this undemocratic regime is by going to the ballot box November 6th to repeal Public Act 4. Everyone who showed up here tonight with the decision and the commitment to spend the night as a leader in this movement to take back our democracy. 
And please join us 6 p.m. August 29th at Greater Galilee Baptist Church for a strategy meeting so we can, as a community, make the decision to take back what is ours, to take back our democracy, to overthrow this law, and to like, really like, educate our community of why we are suffering the way we're suffering, and to propose, I would say, an alternative solution to this mess that Governor Snyder is trying to impose on us. Thank you. Before I call the next speaker, Ms. Sharif made a good point, and I, I just want everyone to listen uh, to what I have to say and remember this. When the city's audit was completed in December, before Mike Brown, the emergency manager, took over the city, we had an audit, and it was completed. And we had gone from about a 16 and a half $17 million deficit down to $8 million. The audit reflects an $8 million deficit. <clears throat> Mike Brown took over in December. Uh, the um, fiscal year started in July. From July to June 30th of this year, when the audit's completed, you'll see an increase in the deficit of about $8 million. So when the audit is done in December, the city of Flint has gone from a deficit of $8 million to a deficit of about 16. And remember that. Remember that, because they'll publish that audit, and I'll be sure and remind everyone that Mike Brown took this city in a deeper deficit than he did when he took over in December. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. David Davenport. Wow. Good evening, Council. Um, you know, as I was sitting back there, I really didn't know what I was going to say when I walked up here. I prayed to the Lord and I asked him, I said, let it be of you what I say. But I remember a couple years ago when I was sitting up here and I was crying, saying, you can't lay off police officers and watch these people die. Everybody looked at me and they called me crazy. Just like he just brought an injunction to go help, he could have put an injunction to stop the man from laying off 56 officers in a city that's number one in the country in homicides, knowing and him claiming to be Democrat, that Democrat bodies were going to start piling up. With a Democrat like that, I don't need no enemies. Now, they say for the love of money is the root of all evil. I believe it. For the love of money is what allowed almost 120 deaths in the last year or two. For the love of money is what allowed the situation that we're in now. <laughs> and we, or some citizens still haven't figured out that clearly these things are being done for you to do yourselves in. They're not doing you in, you're doing yourselves in. They came to you and they said, we want to do this, we want to do this. And as long as it didn't affect you, oh, everything was fine. Yeah. Now it's Lord help me. Election time's coming next year, I know. It's Lord help me. Please help me. I want to get reelected next year. Nobody has control now, do they? But the state that you can't vote for as far as Mike Brown and Ed Kurtz. They're doing what they want to do. They said, if you were weak-minded enough to allow us to come in and you couldn't handle your finances,
then you're going to have to accept what we're doing to you. I'm sorry. You, know, you all know I like you. I've been knowing you for years. But I've been trying to tell you something, and you haven't listened. Because of the messenger, instead of listening to the message. And I'm saying something to you now. Throw these political party titles out the window. Because if it's not Democrats sitting up here, it'll be Republicans next. It's nothing but something to keep your minds boggled against each other. It's called discrimination. It's not racial discrimination, but it's human discrimination. Any pastor in here will tell you that when Jesus goes to take you before God, he's not going to say, was he a Democrat or a Republican? We breathe the same, we bleed the same. It took me a long time to understand that these parties were ridiculous. I noticed that Democrats used to be Republicans, Republicans used to be Democrats. What? All they did was switch the title on the people? And now we're behind it, full-fledged. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. No, you're human. And you need to be treated and respected that way by the elected officials that you put in office. And right now you're sitting here because the elected officials you put in office couldn't do nothing. They can't do anything. Why? Because they're Democrats. All I'm saying is, is that we need to understand. They asked me, Mr. Davenport, why aren't you a Democrat? I belong to Jesus' party. That's it. And when I go up to Congress to represent everyone, I'm not going to worry about a party. As long as you breathe and bleed, I'm going to represent you the same. That's why I ask for your support this November. I'm not here for the fun of it. You think I want to be here talking to you all right now? I could be out shaking hands. I don't know why God got me in this position. And I don't question him. Just like I don't question why Mr. Kincaid is the president and the leader of the Ninth Ward. That's his business. That's what God chose for him. And that's what he chose for me. Let's put the egos away, people. Let's get back on track. The only way we're going to defeat this is to get someone in a higher office that can help ease the pain after they finish forcing this on you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Robert Stewart. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Bob, pull the mic down just a little bit, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Robert Stewart. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak. And uh, unlike a lot of the uh, council meetings, um, we've got a crowd here that's asking for your help. And uh, Sheldon Neely, you sure delivered it with, uh, with that document, and I thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to answer uh, one of the fellow's questions when I came in. Um, about the, the water. As you all know, I'm a water guy. I used to be called uh, Wastewater Bob. That was my nickname because I sold waste plants, um, municipal plants, and, um, and drinking water plants. So I did a little research before coming over here, and um, I found out that in 1978, the cost of water to Flint was $2.85 per 1,000 cubic feet. Now, there's seven and a half gallons in a cubic foot, so that's 7,500 gallons. That's roughly two months worth of water. So let's say $10, uh, uh, well, in 2013, on the, on the Detroit city budget, they are ch charging the city of Flint $13.36 per thousand cubic feet. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> that's about $10 per household. Now, is anybody here paying $10 per month for your water? <laughs> so what's, what's been going on here? Ever since Jimmy Rutherford left, every mayor, and in, in the, in, when the Flint Journal reports it, 
Um, let's look at round numbers. If Detroit raises their rate 10% to the city of Flint, that's 10% of $13.36 or $1.36 or roughly 75 cents for a month. But what the mayor has been doing, and maybe um, the emergency manager too, and maybe you guys, I don't know, but as recorded in the Flint Journal and other news media, they raise the rate 10%. Well, 10% of what is now $166 for a two-family home is 16 bucks, when, when really 10% would be a buck. So this exponential phenomena has been going up, up, up. Now, it is against federal law for a municipality to divert a municipality dollar they have to be T-charted and spent for either reducing the cost of water or improving the quality of water. It is against federal law to divert that dollar for any purpose other than those two. Now comes an issue about the pipeline. So I added it up. 1.1 billion for the pipe 500,000 for the engineering, 200,000 to move the pump station, which Flint owns, which Jimmy Rutherford built, and the, the existing drain commissioner wants to take it away from you and move it when you own it. We paid for that pump house. They have to build two water treatment plants. You have to have a redundant system according to federal law. One water treatment plant, 446 million, another 150 million. <clears throat> that adds up to 1.7 billion at a 4% bond. Now there's no way, given just the interest on the bond, that we can make water for $13.36 per thousand cubic feet when we have to uh, pay off for that pipeline. Now, Jeff Wright is your existing drain commissioner. He's been there th for 34 years. Puts it on the other end of the scale. He says, based on the increases, we have a 30-year payback. But the increases have been illegal. Somebody is in violation of federal law. I've been scared up until tonight because I think now the responsibility is with you people and you can figure this out. Now, under state law, the, the emergency manager has until December 31st to opt in to this pipeline. <laughs> if, if the emergency manager is out, well then the responsibility may go to city council and the mayor. And my request is, is that the city of Flint opt out to retain your water rights. You own <laughs> you own, we own the rights to the Detroit pipeline. That's worth money. It could be sold to the private sector. You own the pump house and you own, we own the Stewart Street water treatment plant. There, there is no way that we should allow the county to come in here and take it away from the city. Water is our gold. Water is our asset that is the draw to bring new industry into this, not only city, but county. Bob, you've exceeded your five minutes. Please sum up. Yes. Um, Thank you. Well, I think, I, I think that's it. Thank you. I thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mr. President. Councilman Lawler. Yeah, I think this is a good time for me to um, introduce add-on number two. 
Uh, resolution to convene investigative hearing. And uh, just uh, that the public would know, this investigative process will include uh, the Genesee Towers, Smith Village, and the water rates. Resolution, the resolution reads as, by the, by the Flint City Council, whereas on August the 8th, 2012, the emergency manager approved more than 62 resolutions under PA4 of 2011, and whereas the emergency manager approved the above stated resolutions the same day he was removed from office as a result of the placement of PA4 on the November 6, 2012 election ballot by the State Canvassing Board, and whereas the Flint City Council states that it is believed that the emergency manager and his administration approve such resolutions to use public assets and resources for private use that is believed to be, to be Ill illegal and of conflict of interest. Whereas the emergency manager unfairly approved the increase of water rates on the city of Flint residents. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Flint City Council will conduct investigative hearings regarding possible illegalities and conflict of interest to use public assets, resources for private use and increased water rates on September 10th, immediately following the city council meeting at 5.30 p.m. is the proposed time for the investigative uh, hearings to proceed. So I therefore move that this resolution be approved. Support. It's been moved and supported. Discussion? Roll? Well, Mr. President, Mr. Wait, President. I'm sorry. Councilman Freeman? Yeah, I'll probably be the bad guy tonight, and that's fine. It won't be the first time. But how do these hearings create a solution to the problem that we've got here? I think we all agree, and including myself, that we're probably not that we don't qualify or we should not be under Public Act 72, that we don't believe that now we need an emergency manager. How does this investigative hearing process provide a solution to that? Well, Councilman... Uh, I mean, I don't deny that it makes good politics. Councilman but, Freeman, about, I, well, I think we... Solutions, how does this create a solution to high water rates? How does this create a solution to giving away Genesee Towers? How does this create a solution to the manager giving away $750,000? Which I, I'm not in agreement with. I think it was wrong that he gave that money away. But how does this create a solution to that? Well, I think we all can probably add to, the, to that discussion of how it can, can bring a solution. But I think everybody on this council is, is aware that there has been misappropriation of the water and sewer fund. When we, when, we, when we started an investigative process, it was made clear and known to us then that there was misappropriation of the water and sewer fund. And we're not sure that there's not misappropriation of it being handled now, because it doesn't make sense why the water rates have to increase when actually when you look at your bill, when you look at your, your, your water and sewer bill, you're being charged more for the services. What has been the improvement on services? It's not the units, it's not the units of water that we are using as, as residents, but it's the service fees that we're being charged astronomical fees for. So um, I would encourage you to be a part of this process and even if, even if you're, even if you're, it, it, it's unknown to you right now, maybe it will be made known to you in the process of the investigation.
Mr. President, Councilman, I appreciate all of that. Um, but the bottom line is, is we're going to sit here um, for however long these hearings take. We're going to go into these hearings knowing that we've got high water bills, um, knowing that they're going to be higher probably next year. And at the end, Order, order. Nope. And at the end of the hearings, we're going to be in the same boat that we're in right now. Because Public Act 72 doesn't allow us to effectuate anything or to change anything. To order. change to change anything as it relates to finances. So what are we going to accomplish through these hearings? And, and as far as I'm concerned. Public Act 72 does not exist. And that, that sounds good, but we've got to deal with reality. And the reality is, is that we've got an emergency manager because the state says, and I don't disagree with you that we shouldn't be under Public Act 72. I'm in total agreement with that. But the reality is, is that we do have an emergency manager that's controlling the finances of the city. And how does this investigative hearing process, is there a better way to get to the same end that you're trying to get to other than an investigative hearing? Well, I, 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 would, I would ask you that question, if there's a better way, because... I believe there is. Let, let, me, let me say, this, this, is, this is the way that the Charter gives us authority I'm fully to address the these works. issues. So, it's our investigative powers that we have, and you know, I think we need to be exercising our investigative powers to get down to the bottom of what's going on. Respectful of us, or you know, I'll have you removed, and you know, or we'll suspend these council meetings for a while until people can come to order. Now, we're respectful of you when you speak. I want you to be respectful of us. All right, it's a, it's, it's a two way street here. And we're all here for the same reason and the same purpose. We want to make Flint a better place. Any one else? Councilman, are you done, Councilman Freeman? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sheldon, you, you want to go next? Then I've got Jackie. Yeah. And yeah. then I want to respond. Yeah, just, just to, to answer, to help try to uh, answer the question that Councilman Freeman has put forth. To engage in an investigative hearing, as Councilman Lawler said, that is our right to do on behalf of the residents of the city of Flint to uncover any wrongdoing that could have transpired. Upon conclusion of an investigative hearing, if we uncover any wrongdoing, we can forward that information to the Department of Justice for prosecution of criminal activity. Because federal violations... I am one to believe that federal violations have been uh, conducted by the, the administration and the emergency manager and others, but we need to make sure our scope is uh, to take a good scope, a good look at it, so we can forward information over to the Department of Justice so justice can prevail in the city of Flint. And that, that's the outcome that I see from an investigative hearing. And I hope that clears it up just a little bit about what I'm thinking about an investigative hearing. Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. In my opinion, these investigative hearings they're needed for the simple reason it will allow the culprits that are circumventing our money, whichever way they want to, to come to the table and either tell the truth, tell a lie, get caught in it, and go to jail. 
Now, on the other hand, this is also opening up the eyes of the people. Because if you watch, and if you have watched, the governor, the judges, Mr. Kurtz, and Mr. Brown, they happen to be all of the same voting types of people, better known as the Republicans. So let's see under oath how they're going to stick together. Will they do the right thing or will they do the brotherly thing where they stick together like glue no matter if it's the truth or it's not the truth? Because I do remember us going down this road once before. We had an investigative hearing about Patsy Lou in the parks. And Mr. Mike Cox was then the Attorney General, and he found that there was no wrongdoing. And we had city employees that did illegal work come before this investigative hearing, and they testified on the wrongdoings that they did. But because of what someone owes someone, someone has on someone, then we didn't get anything. But even if we don't prevail, we are sending a message that we're sick and tired of sick and tired of your brotherly love and your lies. Councilman Nolan, um, you know, I'm definitely in support of the investigative hearing too, and I think that this is the perfect time to actually read this um, statement. It says, to whom it may concern, this letter, this letter is to express our deep concern regarding the issues that need immediate attention in the city of Flint. Democracy dictates intervention by those elected officials chosen by the citizens of the city of Flint. Democracy also dictates that since the citizens of Flint are the, recipient, are the recipients of negative impact of resolutions passed by the EFM, they expect accountability from those officials that are elected. The Flint branch of the NAACP has a long history of fighting for the rights of all people. We know of people in the Flint, of, of Flint are included from the, the, the democratic process. We stand shoulder to shoulder, heart to heart, with our brothers and sisters who are trying to gain democracy back to the people. It is the NAACP's prayer and hope that the hearing by elected officials elected to serve the community can be allowed the citizens some clarity. They have, since December 1, 2011, been overburdened by taxes, water hikes, and loss of city resources. It's incumbent on the city council to investigate and report the findings to the people. Um, democracy is a great equalizer. Anarchy will prevail without democracy. Um, and this is signed, the struggle continues. Francis L. Gilchrist, president of the Flint branch of the NAACP. So, you know, we have the uh, community that's definitely behind us. And I do think that we need to go forward with this um, investigative hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I, I just want to want to respond to the to the um, resolution. I, I support the resolution. I, I kind of see where Councilman Freeman sees it that we probably won't have an outcome, but I still think that it's important that we have an investigative hearing. Just like a few speakers earlier this evening said what we need to do is file for injunctive relief yes. in the court on Public Act 72. There's been a lawsuit filed over the commingling of the water and sewer dollars in the city of Flint. Uh, the lawsuit um, also claims that the rate increases were done illegally. And all of that information has been presided to the court, circuit court, and to the U.S. or to the state Supreme Court by uh, Attorney Val Washington, and we're just waiting for Judge Ewell to make a decision on the lawsuit. It's over in his court, and we are hoping that a decision will come soon on that lawsuit. I think it's important that as we agree to file for injunctive relief over Public Act 72, that it was as important to file a lawsuit 
over the Ill illegal and misuse of water funds in the city of Flint. So I, I think that we can have our investigative hearing and hopefully the court uh, will make a decision on the lawsuit that's been filed on behalf of the residents of the city of Flint and we will find out some information on the investigative hearing. Judge Ewell is the judge that has the case. All of the information has been provided. All the briefs have been submitted and we're just waiting on Judge Ewell to uh, make his decision on the lawsuit that's been filed in district court. And then um, the case has been filed at the uh, state Supreme Court. Once Judge Ewell makes his decision, we'll bypass the appeals court and go right to the state Supreme Court if, if we need to. So um, it's two roads, and we need to travel both of them. Thank you. Mr. President. Councilman Wayhill. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I want to go on record as saying I do support investigative hearings. Um, when Mr. Brown was appointed in December, he promised transparency. He used the word transparency more than once. And so for me, it's important to find out what the facts are and what the truth is regarding a number of his orders, which I, are troubling to me. Um, so I want to go on record as supporting investigative hearings. I have some concerns about the language of the resolution. Um, for me, an investigative hearing is about acquiring the facts, and as Councilman Neely points out, if there is wrongdoing, if we can discover wrongdoing or illegalities, then we can take that information and that evidence to the appropriate authorities for them to, to, to tackle and to take on. What the resolution says, though, is that we currently believe there have been illegal activities and conflicts of interest and unfair um, adoption of the water rates. For me, the investigative hearing, the purpose of that is to determine whether that's happened, not to say that that's happened already. So I do not support the language or some of the language that's in here. For that reason, I will vote no on the resolution unless it can be amended. Um, but I, I will attend the investigative hearings and I will ask questions if we, if we hold them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President. Councilman Lawler. Well, if that is the problem with the language of the resolution, we can simply strike where we say we believe and uh, just simply say that uh, there needs to be an investigative hearing uh, to, to the resolutions that have been uh, submitted on uh, August the 8th of 2012. Mr. Lawler, are you making a motion to amend? My suggestion would be to simply eliminate the third whereas and the fourth whereas, strike those, and basically just call for an investigative hearing. If that's going to satisfy the body, then there's no problem in doing that. I would like to support investigative hearings, so if you'll, a friendly amendment, if you will agree to strike the third whereas and the fourth whereas, I can live with the rest of it. So if you'll put that in the form of a motion, I'll support it. Well, I'll, I move that we strike the third whereas and the fourth whereas and we retain the rest of the resolution. Support. Yeah, and it's just simply saying, it's simply saying that, yes, I support that. Um, Mr. President. Okay, it's been moved and supported to amend uh, add on number two to a point one. I supported it initially. The first, first, I'm sorry. When he made the motion the first time, I supported it the first time. Okay. All right. What, what so, you need, do you, he needs support for his? Does he need support? Support. Yes. So there was a support. Okay. I thought Mike supported it. No, he did. Okay. All right. Okay. So it's been moved and supported. Um, add on number two, as amended, to a point one, um, roll on the amendment. Madam Clerk. Mr. Nolden. Yes. Mr. Freeman. Yes, on the amendment. 
Mr. Lawler? Yes. Mr. Neely? Yes. Mr. Wayhill? Yes. Mr. Sargentson? Yes. Mr. Kincaid? Yes. Ms. Popla? Yes, on the amendment. The vote is eight yes, zero no. Mr. President? Councilman Lawler? I move it as amended. Support. Support. Add on number 2.1 has been moved and supported as amended. Discussion? Roll, Madam Clerk. Mr. Freeman? No. Mr. Lawler? Yes. Mr. Neely? Yes. Mr. Wayhill? Yes. Mr. Sargentson? Yes. Mr. Kincaid? Yes. Ms. Poplar? Yes. Mr. Nolden? Yes. The vote is uh, seven yes, one no. Okay. It's passed. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Mike Kilbreth. Mr. Kilbreth. Good evening, Council. I'm Mike Kilbreth. I'm the President of the Flannery Chamber of Commerce. I want to congratulate you on that motion. Our organization was approached by a couple of councilmen about supporting investigative hearings or resolutions from uh, clergy, uh, community groups, the firefighters union, the police union, and I think it's the right thing to do. The, the other right thing to do from many people that I've been very passionate to for many months are many leaders in this community who no longer you see, you don't see their businesses anymore. They've made their fortune. We need investigative hearings with attorneys that represent this council and the citizens of this community. The Flannery Chamber of Commerce, we're going to supply attorneys for any of you councilmen. We're going to pay the bill. We're, bagging the, we're going to bring a bag of money. We're going to take care of that for you. We'll take care of the subpoenas. We want to make sure that this emergency manager knows he's illegal. He shouldn't be here. But more important, More, more important than that, these investigative hearings need to go a little deeper. I've been talking, and I've had a dream for a long time that there'd be some common sense around this place. And I see some council people that have stepped up to the plate. I, I believe that it's time that you get busy and, and let people follow you. You need to lead them. We need to make sure that our community can stand out to people that will invest money here. And right now, they won't do it. We have citizens that are hurting. And yet we have an emergency manager who is removed and he's making $170,000 a year. That violates the city charter as a city administrator. He can't do that. We need lawsuits. And Mr. Kincaid, you are correct. We need to go to circuit court. But Mr. Mays and, and Mr. Dumas, they, they very eloquently put together a, a presentation of why the law is legal. They're, they sounded pretty good. I think any judge with common sense can read the laws because I've read it to a lot of attorneys and they agree with me and they agree with their version of it. It can't be done. So we need to go to court. But we need attorneys and we don't need a lawsuit written on a piece of paper, as Mr. May said. We need a lawsuit written by attorneys who care enough to step up and help out in this community. Because we need, we need to create jobs. I want to bring solutions tonight. We need jobs, okay? The, the water guy, I've talked to him and I, I'm proud that most of the leaders in this community, I've had conversations with them, are people who are close to them. They're good people in this community. We need to get those good people together on one page. And I am proud to say that most of the civic groups, the community groups that we've talked to are behind us. What do we do? I I'm ready to do something, okay? The water guy, he talks about water and he tells you all this stuff and he can't say hello in five minutes. Let me tell you real quickly, Atlanta, Georgia, they're out of water. Three and a half years ago, they told the industry, hey, you got 10 years. That's seven and a half years left. Let's get some people in this community on the same page and go to Atlanta and bring back 12 to 15,000 jobs and do it right now. Because we have a water plant that millions of dollars was poured into that. We've looked at the pipeline. That pipeline can bring jobs. Okay, but we need to amend it. We don't need two pipelines. We've got a Flint water plant. We have the city of Detroit that's selling us water even though they had 400 and some million dollars of corruption in their water plant. We have a Flint City Council that began investigative hearings and found out that Mayor Walling allowed an individual that you guys fired to be paid out of the water fund. Are you kidding me? Why isn't he in jail? Okay, we need some people in jail in this community. I'm telling you, if we can get cooperation, 
There's people that don't live in Flint. I don't live in Flint. It's dangerous here. You know, it's after dark, the people are trapped that they can't get out of Flint. We need to make Flint better so people want to live here. We need to make Flint better so people can afford to live here. When your water bill is so high you can't afford it, and your street light assessment, and your garbage pickup assessment, that's a tax, okay? You can't raise taxes. And I got one more for you. You know, the Genesee Towers, that's a tax. They didn't pay the bill. You know why they didn't pay the bill? I think they ought to go to jail for not paying the bill. Because if they paid the bill, the city would have missed payroll. What does that mean? Mayor Walling's out long ago. And here comes the emergency manager. Now, there's a reason for people wanting an emergency manager because of misuse of tax dollars. People are tired of having their tax dollars spent on cities that throw it away. Now, I hope this council gets together and does real investigative hearings. Part of our agreement is we'll supply the attorneys, but you better make sure you answer, ask the questions. Because I want to make sure that, as Mr. Lawler and Mr. Neely have said, people need to go to jail, okay? When you steal my money, I want you to go to jail. Now, I, I believe in my heart that there are enough good people in this community that will rise up and make sure good things happen for the city of Flint. People need jobs. And the business community, I have never met anyone that wants to invest money where they can't make money. This city has to have police. It has to have fire. Our city looks like it's been hit by bombs. It looks like Iraq or Afghanistan. Mr. Kilbride. We gotta repair it and rebuild it. And part of that, as I close, Councilman, uh, we also would like to, and this might be a difficult situation, but we wanna supply not only a dream team of attorneys, we already have seven committed and they're very fine attorneys. And we wanna also go to the governor on the other side and make sure when they arrest people, let's put a, a team in here that will save a whole bunch of money because I can identify a million dollars right now that people have talked about because we don't need any of them. The next gentleman who's gonna speak is a former general supervisor at General Motors. He's a successful businessman. He has the ability for nothing. He doesn't want any money. He just wants to fix Flint. We need people like that and a team of people that say, keep your million dollars We'll fix Flint, get out of the way. But we need councilmen to help lead and make sure you have that attitude to fix this city. Thank you very much. You. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. The next speaker is Mr. Craig Smith. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Council and President. I just want to shoot a few numbers at you. And as uh, Ms. Sharif and, and President Kincaid mentioned about the amount of money that Michael Brown has spent. And he went out to all the neighborhood meetings and he talked about how he cut $655,000. And since he did that, he, Ms. Sharif gave the number and I think now it's approaching about a million three. We have redundancy in the city administrator, as you all know. We have redundancy in uh, the, the uh, attorney's office now because now he's added Ward Chapman. And I don't know how much money that is. It hasn't been public. 57,000, thank you. And I don't know why we need more city attorneys because our police officers aren't arresting anybody so we can't have any cases to try. Now, give you a few more numbers. Um, Mr. Walling, when he went in, stated that he was going to add police. That was one of his campaign promises three years ago. And he even talked about having police officers on bicycle, a bicycle patrol. And any of you people that went to his, his uh, campaign knew that. Instead, what he has done is he's cut police officers. And, and I don't know the exact number, but it's somewhere around 65. And if you use $100,000 a man, which is a number that the city has used, that's $6.5 million a year. Now, when he took over, depending on who you listen to, said the deficit was $10 million. Now, if he's cut $6.5 million a year, and then he went to the state and borrowed another $6 million a year, I don't know how we continue to operate 
continually operate at a $9 million a year deficit. Give you another little thing. Michael Brown, when he went into this as the interim mayor, when Williamson was forced out, he, he was made, he was made the city, uh, city, admini or city administrator, ended up being the mayor, and depending on who you talk to, he went in with a $10 million deficit. Please, will you just let me finish? Now, he went in with about a $10 million deficit. Walling, when he took over seven months later, that deficit, I think, was the same. But if you look at Michael Brown's resume, it will state that he turned over the city to a 500, with a $500,000 surplus. Now, I don't know, but there was a football coach that went to Notre Dame, O'Leary, he falsified his resume. And for those of you that don't know what happened to him, he was fired before he ever coached a game. So from my standpoint, Michael Brown should be fired before he ever sets foot in this city. Now a few more numbers. Uh, if you look at what they were talking about, the city, and, city water and sewer fund, I think there was $750,000 that was diverted over to Smith Village for the infrastructure that I don't think is complete yet. According to previous administrators, it was already there anyway. I don't know who's telling the truth there, but it was $750,000 that went out of the water and sewer fund. And somebody else, I think it was Mike Kilbreth, talked about a city employee that was paid out of the city and water sewer fund. That was Steve Monell after his job was eliminated. And he, in these hearings, admitted to his pay, his paycheck being taken out of the city and water sewer fund so you can have your rates increased. But the bottom line of all this is we don't need a city manager. I'm not sure that the previous administration was much better because we continue to operate at a deficit. And the current administration or city man or financial manager his answer and his people, Jerry Ambrose, say they're working on balancing the budget for 2013 and that they're going to have a balanced budget for you. But that balanced budget is dependent on getting between 20 and $25 million loan from the state. So it's not helping us any when he cuts 655000 he's added a million three, the clock keeps ticking, more money is being spent, and these people ought to be indicted. These people that are stealing from the city, when you do these investigative hearings, as Mike Kilbert stated, they need to be indicted, they need to go to jail. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Pastor, before, Pastor before. Kenneth Stewart. <clears throat> Good, good evening, Pastor. Be before you start, I, I just want to make an announcement. Councilman Wayhill had a previous um, commitment that he had to go to this evening, so he, uh, he had to leave at 7 o'clock, or he had to be there at 7 o'clock. So that's why Councilman Wayhill um, left this evening. Pastor Stewart, I'm sorry. Thank you for being here this evening. Amen. <clears throat> good evening to everyone. I just want to uh, address, you know, everybody, nobody in particular, because uh, I'm one that don't believe in saying much until I have all, all the facts. Um, but from my observation, what I would like to uh, just suggest and perhaps uh, recommend um, to whomever it may concern that in the future that when uh, the situation is resolved and fixed uh, for the best interest of the citizens of Flint because I believe uh, wholeheartedly that this just didn't get broke overnight. 
it's something that basically happened progressively uh, as time kind of went along. And so uh, my suggestion that is that in the future that when it gets fixed to be sure that the city officials, the elected officials, or whoever uh, is in charge of running the city make sure that they act on the best interest of the people. Because I think we got to this point basically because somebody was acting, but they weren't acting on the best interest of the people. And so I think if that takes place, then we won't end up at this point again in nowhere near in the future because uh, me as a religious leader, uh, I try to inform uh, my parishioners about the things that goes on in the community, but I don't inform them opinions. I have to inform them of truth or facts. And so uh, that, that way you can make the proper judgment call because uh, I was taught that everybody that's got a hind part got an opinion. <laughs> so, uh, but that's just my, you know, uh, observation. I actually don't live in the city of Flint, but I work uh, two jobs here in the city of Flint and just whatever I can do uh, to make Flint better for everybody, not just me, uh, then I'm willing to do it. So, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm praying for this entire city and everybody that, uh, to whomever it may concern because it's a mess, but it can be fixed. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it can be fixed, but it's going to take a unified corporate effort. Ain't no need of nobody, you know, arguing and pointing fingers and all of that. It's broke now. So what we need to do is rally together and try to fix it and don't let it get broke again. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Stewart, for being here this evening. And I, I agree with you. It, it can be fixed, and it should be the elected officials of this community that represent this community to be the ones to fix it, not somebody from Lansing. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Clerk, our next speaker. Mr. Patrick Riles. My name is Patrick Riles. I live at 2018 Kniff. And I guess it's good to be the king because I was number 13 and I was counting. That's, that's sad. I was number 13 and I was counting. I got to be somewhere too. But that's okay. That's okay. That's what's wrong with this city. <clears throat> we fought the good fight. We did due diligence and we still have nothing to show for it. Flint Park Lake, CDC. Smith Village, CDC. Northeast Village, CDC. That stands for Citizens District Council. You got awarded funds because of us, and you did everything in your power to see that we never had it available on our side of town, where we actually live, to address the issues of blight and despair in our neighborhoods. It was reprogrammed. It was held back. It was sent back. It was misused, it was abused, and it was paid back. 13 years, Flint Park Lake has been around. Smith's Village has been around for at least 15 to 16 years. And Northeast Village is right behind us. We tried to work within the guidelines you set up, and you failed us. But you know, we're like duct tape. You know, you stick duct tape on something, and when you pull it off, there's pieces of it still left. You know, that, we, we ain't going nowhere. We definitely, regentification ain't working on us. Okay? And, 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 and as I quote from a movie, The Color Purple, when Miss Seeley was telling that hard-headed man, he said that whatever you do in life won't amount to a hill of beans until you do by right by us on the north side. It's coming. A time is coming. Okay? 
And for all you renegade folks out there, that's people that want to give us advice that don't live in Flint, that don't, don't weather the storm with us, don't hang with us, want to come in here and give us suggestions and then go back to your good, rich, grand blank, flushing, Davis, or wherever the heck you live. You know what I'm saying? There's a day of reckoning coming. There's a day of reckoning coming. You see what I'm saying? Now, I'm going to vote no on a public safety millage. The reason why is because I want at least one half or more of those officers living among us in the same mess, the same crime, the same lack of services that we experience. I want them to have the dog run loose and doodle in their yard. I want to see some people walking down their street urinating in the street. I want them to put up with all this loud banging and shooting all day and all night. See, if we had them in the neighborhood, that would nip it in the bud. Because yeah. Officer Timken or Officer Smith would be over there and say, man, I'm going to go over here and check out baby and boo-boo and make sure they act right. You see what I'm saying? But if they ain't living in the neighborhood and collecting the check and go back home to their pristine area, we can't do with them. We don't need them kind of folk. And, and another thing, now, crime watches are obsolete. We've been watching crime a long time. We don't need to be crying. I, I don't want to watch no more crime. Crime watch is over with. You know, if, if we're in the business of stopping crime, when you call 911, by the time you don't call 911, the crime has already been perpetrated. They done done what they done done, and they done left. So we need to be in the business of actually stopping crime. We need neighborhood policing. I see on my tax rolls, my latest bill, you, you got public safety down there. It used to be neighborhood policing. And y'all got kind of slick on that wording down there. OK? Neighborhood policing mean I knew Officer Timken and Officer Smith. They come through and they have lemonade with me or something like that. We need to get back to that, people, because people don't trust you in the neighborhood. When you got somebody coming over that don't live in the neighborhood, they drawing a the check till they time to leave. And they say, oh, I'm sure glad I got the heck out of Flint. You see what I'm saying? That gets old after a while. We don't need to hear that kind of stuff, OK? Now, also, we do not all want to be farmers on the north side of Flint. I know there's a movement to make us farmers, but there's a difference between farming and gardening. Gardening is already on. You can put as many gardeners as you want, but see, they want us to become farmers. See, and we know the powers that be, a couple of the foundations and had investigations to try to make us farmers. And that's sad. I like to have my lot size a little bigger. I'll buy that property next to me. Hurry up and tear that house down so I can buy it. See what I'm saying? We like to have big lots like everybody else. But so, don't be thinking we want to be farmers over there talking about you worrying about my health. It's too late now. Whatever I got, I got. Let me go and eat what I'm going to eat, but I don't want to be a farmer. Okay? Because when you're farming, you got, to, you got to worry about the animal waste, the food waste, and all the critters coming in to, buy, to eat all that stuff that they done produce. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Our, our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Nathaniel Braswell. Well, my name is uh, Nathaniel Braswell, and I am a resident of the city of Flint. I'm retired. Uh, my children attended school here in the city of Flint and graduated. And I'm finding out now we talk about everything but education. It's my understanding when the schools start this fall that we're going to have an average of 60 kids in the classroom. Incredible. You cannot teach 60 children in a classroom, all right? And I just want to reflect, first of all, my pastor was here, and I'm a member of the House of Prayer. And I would like, at this time, for all the members of the House of Prayer to stand, please. Yeah. We, uh, we, th this is serious business. Uh, and um, it's my prayer that we are following our pastor. You heard him say he's concerned about his sheep. And if you have a church and you are a pastor, you ought to be concerned about your sheep. 
I, you can't tax me no more. I am retired. You are treating me like I got a 40-hour-a-week job. I'm paying state tax, city tax, Flint tax, light tax, paying taxes. I paid $150 for the towers down there that the, that the city manager sold it for $1. You know, that's the crime. I know some people went to jail for doing that. Now, I'm going to get to the business here. On August the 8th, I was allowed to dress this body. And I started out, and I really didn't even know where to start or how to start. But this day, before I do anything, I'm going to thank the Lord for Jesus. Amen. I'm going to thank the Lord for Jesus. Then in closing me with a right mind, to know what's of the Lord and what's of man. We have a lot of evil people trying to run our city. Evil. They don't mean us any good. You, you No good up here in the city council. Let me say this. I gave you guys a hard time last time, but I am really proud for the first time that we get unanimous decision on our vote. Amen. This is what we need. We need cohesiveness. You are all we have. And this cannot be an emotional thing. This place should be packed out. Look here. If you stay in the city, this impacting you, everybody. And look, at, look how we fragmented here. This is, I said I will be back. I am back with a vengeance. I am really highly upset. I am really teed off. I read this article here Sunday, right here, that was printed in here, off limits with a question mark on it. Contending and, and, and Ed Kirsch is saying that uh, it's, it might create some problem, a power struggle. There's no power struggle here. We have a city charter. We are the power. Mm. Yeah. We are the power. It's no power struggle. It's a power struggle for those in carpetbaggers, as you call them, coming into our city, wanting something for nothing, telling us what to do, and leaving, going up I-75 and 69 to their fine quarters, we're leaving us here to fiend for ourselves. Well, there's no more a Willie Lynch, y'all. Mm. Those days are over. You know, uh, I am not going back to Egypt. I'm not being up under no Pharaoh. Amen. You know, I am free. The sister has shackles on. Come on, we all are shackled down. Don't thank you because you got this job. You're in the same boat. And it's our responsibility, y'all. Let me tell y'all this. Don't let this be the last time. Let's hold them accountable. They still got to be accountable. Then if they don't do what we ask them to do, vote them out. Them, vote them out. I mean, that's a requirement. It's hard, but it's fair. And y'all know I'm telling the truth. Because some things happen prior to the city manager coming in here. If you had voted correctly, they wouldn't be in here. Seven to two to bring them in. We need to cut it out, y'all. I'm sick of it. I, you know what? This is deplorable. The things that the, you are doing to us in the city is despicable, disgraceful, distasteful, and outright low down. I mean, I... I got to keep it real, y'all. Don't mean to intimidate you. I'm really, the honest God tell the truth, we need to build bridges and not walls. Yes. Amen. Yeah. And, and, and prior to me coming out here, we heard the Lord said a lot of times, we know who's in control. My five minutes up already? Yep. I'll sit down. Thank you. Our next, <clears throat> our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Order. Can we have some order, please? Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Miss. Yes. Okay. I, I will I will grant you the privilege, Mr. Cleves, to um, have the clerk go through and pull your slip so you can come up and speak right now. Okay. Okay. Because I, I do understand you're on a kidney machine. Mr. Herbert Cleves. Mr. Cleves. 
Uh, thank you. Very you're, kind. You're welcome, Mr. Clay. We have uh, talked about a lot of issues tonight. I'm going to pick up f from the gentleman that, that, that brought up the edu education. Let me tell you all something. Five years ago, I had 18 kids that built five houses at the Genesee Area Skills Center. These kids can build, rebuild, this city. Now I can sit here and point, point fingers, but I'm not. We can hire these kids to rebuild the city of Flint. If we want to stop them from killing each other, give them a job. Give them a job. How can we keep walking around here talking about we are a sane society, and we sitting here letting our kids kill each other. There's some very fundamental things that you can do. I don't want no job, but I can help put together a piece to hire these kids and adults. You won't listen. I was down here. I showed you. The article in, in the paper where the kids built these houses. They can do it. We walk by them every single day and don't even recognize them as human beings. Now, what is that saying about us? What is that saying about us? You got children, adults in this city. They can't read. They cannot write, and they cannot count. If we don't help that woman over there in the educational system, we go into the dogs. It ain't her fault. It is not her fault. The fault is on the folks who can read, who can write, and who can count. That's us. I have a degree. I'm not asked to serve my city or my community. And we know why. Because I'm who I am. And somebody has to put us in check. Somebody has to do it. And it would be so easy for us to save our children. There's other issues that I could raise, but I'm not. I want to help serve on a committee to educate our community. That's what I want to do. I'm good at what I do. And I'm tired of coming down here, getting upset, getting upset by things that are going on here. When I ought to be working with and talking to kids and adults who can't read and write and count, I want to help put that together and get some jobs. And the gentleman here raised the issue about the water line. Look at the jobs sitting right under our noses. Look at the houses that need to be repaired. What is this? Why are we treating each other like this? It's a shame and a disgrace. That's our money. It's our money. We want it to rebuild our set and hire these kids 
so they can quit killing each other. Very simple, very simple, very fundamental demand. Ain't threatening nobody. Go over there and get the records from the Flint Board of Education and ask the superintendent. We got a skill center in this town. It closes every school day at 2.18 in the afternoon. That's insane. People ought to be in that place 24 hours a day. And they're not. She needs help and help from this community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cleves. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Philip Jacks. Mr. Philip Jacks. Uh, good evening, Philip. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, and people, how you guys doing? Um, man, this is cool. Like, uh, there's a lot of people here saying a lot of awesome stuff and all that, blah, 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 blah. But a lot of us came here really ticked off today, and that's a really big sign, you know? Like, there's people here that are ready to put their lives and bodies on the line to get arrested, to go to jail, to get beat in protection of democracy so that you guys could investigate. And that's awesome, it's awesome. It's awesome that it's happening, man. I'm, I'm proud of our city. We even made up a little sign, like, for my girlfriend, she's pregnant, saying, like, don't beat me, I'm pregnant. I don't know if any of y'all go to protests or anything like that, but when Rick Schneider signed PA4, taking away democracy from the citizens of Michigan, we were all sitting there in Lansing, and I don't know if anyone remembers the news, but we took over that building. We barricaded ourselves in there and got beat and maced and arrested, and the people took the people's building. The people are pissed off about this shit, excuse my French, but they're really mad enough to bring in sleeping bags and pillows and lock themselves in a building and go through it again for our city. And I just wanna say, if we're that mad, please don't fail us. Please do this investigation, send these guys to jail. And I don't wanna see no country club jail that all these rich dudes always get off on. I don't wanna see them in a prison where they don't gotta worry about getting raped where they don't gotta worry about getting knifed, where they don't gotta get worry about getting cut in the face by some jerk. I wanna see them in the real prison that we all go to and we screw up. And I wanna see them in there for a long, long time. Because when you take public funds from any municipality, whether it's the richest municipality or whether it's the poorest in this nation, you are acting in treason against the people that have entrusted you to protect our futures and to protect us. We're born in this country and we're told that this is the people's country, that it's the greatest place in the earth. But when we look at the statistics, we have failing schools across the country, we got failing health care, we got failing governments, we got rapid corruption, and it's all because the rich ain't paying their share. I'm hearing, what are we, what are we in deficit for, like 15 million or something like that? That's a lot of dough, that's a lot of rolls, man. But there's a $700 million corporation sitting in the city. Uptown redevelopment is owned by eight different men that combined together are worth more than $100 million. I'm sitting here paying 25, 30% tax on the four to 10 grand I'm lucky to bring in if I can. Where's their 25% to 30% tax? Because just on them uptown douches that are taking our water tower or taking our tower from us that we paid $9 million for, I don't know, if they paid 25% tax instead of having shelters, maybe we'd have that, that 15 million that we're in deficit for and we wouldn't have an emergency financial manager. No more tax shelters for these rich jerks. And when we do an investigation, push hard, guys, please. Because if you guys will push, and if the state wants to say, no, you can't do this because this is illegal 72 law, I am telling you the people will stand here and we will let you do your investigation. We will barricade those doors. We will do whatever the heck we gotta do. And we'll stand here in defense of our city, in defense of democracy, so that these people can get punished. But if we're gonna do it, follow through. Throw them in jail forever.
Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. The next speaker is Mr. Brian Morrissey. Mr. Morrissey. All right, y'all. I came here today to, to sit in here, to really, really to sleep in, in defense of democracy. Oh. All right. Uh, I would have never thought a few months ago that I would be here supporting all of y'all right here, because I, I didn't like none of y'all about, about probably two months ago. I, I ain't like y'all at all. But, uh, and just as I know, y'all know, you would have never expected all these people here to be supporting y'all. Every person in this room is out here supporting y'all today. Anybody not supporting these people? Anybody? I mean, y'all see it. So you're going to have to work real hard here after this meeting, after all this, to keep this level of support. I mean, to keep any kind of support. But... Uh, I want to address the people that really made all this happen today, though. I like, I like y'all, but I really want to address the people with the power here, the people. Taking a page out of Eric Mays' book here. What up, Eric? All right. What, what happened here today with Kurtz backing Moore, off, saying that they could Mr. Put, Moore, Mr. Moore, please, please address the council. That, that's what we're here for. Thank well, what, you. what happened here today? With Kurtz backing off, allowing y'all to do this investigation in these chambers, is because of what these people out here did. It was the threat of them taking their power back. You know what I'm <clears throat> Kurtz, his superiors, Snyder and Dylan, they got scared. They know what happens when the people learn where the real power's at. I hope, I hope y'all don't forget, I hope y'all learn what power y'all have out of this and, and exercise this, because everybody up here, y'all get your power from these people here. So that's what it is. I'm going to leave it at that. No disrespect turning my back on y'all, because I'm loving all y'all right now. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Ms. Bethany Hazard. Ms. Hazard. Ms. Hazard. Here she comes. Yep. Thank you. I don't have a lot to say. I'm going to be short, but I bought my house. Pull in it Flint. down just a little bit so everybody can hear I you. I bought a house in Flint maybe eight years ago at the most. Ever since I moved in my house, I watched everything fall apart and all my neighbors leave. It's so sad. First, they cut the police so when people were robbed or tied up in their homes, the police never came. I watched a girl getting beat up in front of my house. The police didn't get come to, for three hours. So, of course, these people that worked and paid taxes moved. Everybody's gone. Um, Allegheny is all rentals now. I talked to the landlord. He says, yes, chart hard time renting them out because the utilities are so high here like water and stuff. Um, I don't know a lot about this stuff. Um, then the water went way up. My best friend across the street's moving. Two other ladies that lived in Flint for 30 years, tears in her eyes, told me she's leaving because of what they're doing here. They don't like the politics. So it's just sad that nobody cares about the people that live here. I mean, I feel like you guys want me to move. I figure in two years I should just leave this house, but I paid almost seventy thousand dollars. Can't get ten for it now. Can't get ten. So it's just sad that you guys, the city works so hard to get rid of taxpayers. And then I read on M Live, people were mad because people went and protested, and they said uh, people in Flint better. Some people outsiders were saying we better wake up. We don't work here. We're just a bunch of whatever bums. That's not true. Most people in my neighborhood worked. Maybe we're not rich, but the people worked. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Our 
Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Scott. I'm sorry. Oh, Councilman Sargentson. I would just like to say something about uh, the pipeline uh, and what she was talking about. Uh, if we continue with these water rates the way they are right now and with their plans to raise taxes, we will have no need for a pipeline because we will not have the population to support anything like that. And, you know, so that's where we're headed right now with these water rates and everything else that's going on with this city. So, you know, we're not going to have a need for a pipeline if we have no people in this community to drink the water. Thank you. Madam Clerk, our next speaker, please. The next speaker is Blair Neifert. Good evening, Council, Good evening. and my fellow citizens of Flint. Good evening. <clears throat> um, I got to make a real quick announcement. Uh, Nayira made an announcement about a strategic meeting at the Greater Galley Baptist Church, uh, 6 o'clock on Wednesday. The address for that church is 4418 Industrial Street between Stewart and Black. Uh, anybody that wants to come out and, and talk about how we can further support the council in uh, trying to repeal Public Act 4, make sure that that happens. And uh, yeah, so. Um, Real quick, just wanted to address uh, Mr. Freeman about your question on how um, these investigations can, how they can help uh, out with solutions. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is the fact that it, uh, the times that we live in right now are really confusing for people. We know that some real bad stuff is happening, but it's really hard for us to find out why these things are what is actually happening and why these things are happening. And an investigation, if it's successful, will show us some truths that we really need to know. And with the uh, Public Act 4 being on the ballot, up for repeal on the ballot in November, um, we need to know why we, we should be voting that down. Um, there's still a lot of people in this community and in the greater community of Michigan that don't even know what Public Act 4 is. And uh, we've seen it rear its ugly head here, and we need to know exactly what's going on. Um, and my, the last thing I wanted to say was that uh, I'm really excited about being here and seeing, first of all, you guys voting unanimously to uh, do this investigation. Not unanimously, but almost unanimously. Um, that makes me feel proud to have a city council. Um, I'm also, even more proud to be in a room full of people that are speaking their minds, having the courage to come up here, talk about their woes, and, and expose some truths, and sticking together and trying to make this place better. So, thank you, guys. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Chris Del Moroni. Thank you. My name is Chris Del Moroni and I live in Flint, Michigan. We've heard a lot of things tonight, but I think one of the solutions to many of our problems is that we bring pressure on those who benefit the most from what Brown and Kurtz have done. And we know we're if, if you look at the trail, if you follow the money trail, it leads to that group called Uptown. And one could include the Ma Foundation with that too. If we, if we as a community bring pressure on that group and their interest, I think we will see far greater results. Imagine 200 people every Saturday picketing down at the Flint uh, Farmer's Market. Imagine them asking questions to the Board of Regents of the University of Michigan, asking them how is it that the University of Michigan moved their entire business school from the campus of U of M Flint 
to the Hyatt Regency, the old Hyatt Regency. How did that happen without a bid? That's where we need to be putting pressure on. Not that Kurtz and Brown are, 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 are um, you know, not, not part of this, but they are simply the puppets in this game. Others are pulling the string, and we need to recognize that. Ask yourself this question, what is, what is the need for Uptown to acquire the downtown development parking lots adjacent to the Genesee Towers? They're going to tear the towers down, supposedly, according to the Flint Journal, and put a park there. Why do they need more parking down there? Keep in mind, it was Uptown in the chamber that came to this council, or to the city council, it may have not been this one, to build the Rutherford parking deck, pleading with the city, go ahead and do it. And I stood here and I says, don't back those bonds. Don't do that. And we now know that every year we're paying over $100,000 to back those bonds on the Rutherford parking deck, which at times, from what I'm being told, people cannot even park in it. They will not allow people to park in it to collect revenue. It is a sin. It's a travesty. It is terrible. Hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to pay for a parking deck. I mean, we're talking more police, more fire. It is terrible. The food bank of Eastern Michigan wants to take over part of one of our parks and put a parking lot there. Bring pressure on them. Go to your unions, go to your employers and say it's a bad deal to donate to the food bank for all the good they do. At times, sometimes we need to, to hurt ourselves. Think about the sit-downers here in Flint, Michigan in 1936 and 37. They gave up their Christmas. They gave up their New Year's. They stayed in cold plants without heat. They took on the bosses of the company. What are we doing in our community? What is our sacrifice? We have men and women in our country fighting a war right now. What has been our sacrifice? Think of World War II. Think of the sacrifices that the men and women of this country who were not directly in the service, think of the sacrifices that they gave up, the sacrifices they gave. When you do your investigative hearing, ask who issued the bonds, who was the underwriter for the bonds for the parking deck. There might be some surprises in there. You need to find out how you can get out from underneath that parking deck. Let the Downtown Development Authority take care of that. If they think they should be able to sell those lots to Uptown, maybe they could take care of the, the parking deck, their financial obligation. It's their civic responsibility. It's their moral responsibility. It's their legal responsibility. There are many things in this community that we can do to improve it. We just need to be doing that. But the Kerry Dondi Water Authority, that's a bad deal. I, I, you know, I'm sorry, Council, I came here before. I said, don't do it. We heard a little bit about education this evening. The Flint, the, the Flint School Board came to the, uh, the citizens of Flint and asked for four mills for a sinking fund to, to fix up the schools. I told the school board, don't do this right now. I'll sum up here real quick. Uh, don't do this right now. They are actually fixing schools. They've fixed some schools up, and now they're closing them. We will be paying for those repairs, for new lights, parking, and, and all those improvements, and we're not even going to be using the schools. Thank you. Thank you. next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Joe Lee. Mr. Lee. Hello, everybody, Council. Out of due respect, uh, it's been a long time since I've been down here, but uh, I pay just as many taxes in the Flint as any other Flint residents. And I'm kind of, you know, like I want to kind of observe, and I've been learning a lot, you know, see what's going on first. And you know, seem like most of the time, most of the information we're getting 
the journal no more before y'all seem to know what's going on. You know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm observing wrong. And then since I've been here this evening, I see that all of the consul, you know, I can tell by attitudes and the way some of them spoke. I'm not going to point no fingers at no specific individual. But all of y'all are not on board, too, don't seemingly to me. But like I say, I'm mostly observing. I'm not going to point no whole lot of fingers. And uh, I've learned a lot. I've, I've learned a lot from more than the citizens that's been getting up here than I've learned from y'all. And then that paper y'all pass out is not too much information in there. So uh, maybe, I ought to, maybe I ought to maybe try to go to a meeting at the Flint Journal and get some more information. But I'm going to keep watching and listening, you know. And uh, I'm going to be respectful, like the president say, be respectful. And uh, prayerful also. Because I'm a God-fearing man. I believe in God. And uh, most of the time, I'll be back, though. Is it on that paper when the next meeting? I didn't see it. Is it any, and then uh, I got a, just one more question. Is there any other way to get information as to what Kurtz, Brown, DDA, and all of them are doing? Do, you, do the council keep up with it some kind of way? Where can I get the information from other than the Flint Journal? Okay, I have to go online. Okay. Uh, I appreciate y'all and keep up the good work or keep trying to work hard for our city. Thank you, Mr. Ray. <laughs> Mr. President. Councilwoman Poplar. Yes, Mr. Lee. Jackie, pull your mic up just a little bit. Okay. So they Mr. Can hear. Lee, did you not, um, you say you didn't see the next schedule meeting date? It's on here. It's um, scheduled for Monday, September the 10th. At 5:30. Nice seeing you, Joe. Thank you, Jackie. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Mr. Paul Herring. Mr. Herring. Good evening, Council. Good evening, Paul. I've been sitting over in the corner and I've been debating on what to say. I've been debating on how personal I should get with this audience and those viewing at home. I debated on how far I should expose myself to, to make a point. Now, I tell people often that I was the second person fired when the emergency manager took over because when he fired you, he fired me. And I feel that the service that I provided to the council is very beneficial. I feel that the service that I provide to this community is even more so beneficial. Not everybody can make it down here at 530. Not everybody can get what they need to get from the minute and a half on channel 12 and channel 25. This meeting has gone on for almost two hours. How can our networks explain the intensity of this meeting in a minute and a half. It can't be done. The only way this community can stay informed, the only way those who are not here can know what's gone on is if this is broadcast on public access. It's the only way. But unfortunately, I have to quit, guys. I have to stop coming up here for free because I can't pay my rent. I'm a house payment away from foreclosure. I can't take my wife to the valley. Can't do it. Since January, I've been footing the bill for this out of a pocket that does not exist. When I read the order that the manager uh, put you guys back into effect and and made it so that you guys could host the meetings, I thought it was a good day. Wow, I'm back. But then I find out that they have bastardized your budget to the point where you can't buy toilet paper. 
a pen, a pencil, or a paper clip. So without your ability to help me continue to do this, I have to rely on the public. Those of you who are watching it, this at home, find a value in what I've been providing to this city for free. There's a value here. And if it's a dollar or two dollars or five dollars, my God, they charge us 143 for the towers. And they're going to tear that down. I'm trying to bring this up. I'm trying to provide a service to this community. And then I read a press release in your packet that says that they have given public access away to the Flint schools. They've given it away to the next entity that's going to be taken over by an emergency manager. So you know what that means. Public access is going to die in Flint. And we're going to let it happen. We're going to let it happen. Shame on you. I've been coming to this council for more than 11, 12, 13 years explaining the value of public access and how you need to embrace it and how this is your way to communicate with the people. And some of you have listened, but not enough. Not enough. Your next meeting is September 10th. My birthday is September 9th, guys. I quit. I'm done. In all things purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, y'all. But we got to be one like the hand in all things beneficial to our mutual progress. Thank you, Paul. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Billy McChester. Mr. McChester. Good evening, Council. I would say I, could, I like seeing y'all, but I don't have an operation, so I can't see really none of y'all. I'm putting a little humor in it, because y'all tensed up. <laughs> really, what I, I've learned a lot of things here tonight. I haven't been down here a long time. And I was at some other meetings, and I just hope, like we say, I ain't worried about the council members. I ain't worried about them. I like to hold us accountable. Now, you see what happened when we show up. When we show up, if we quit showing up, they can be lax. See what I'm saying? I'm, I got to face y'all because I can't talk to them. See? It's our fault. I like, to, I like to look at my part that I play. But we do need to, right now, like we do need to stop this thing and keep the unity so we can do what we're really down here for. Because none of this other stuff that some of us have concerned that are important can happen if Snyder or agenda keep going. So I hope we keep this unity going, you know, and do things for Flint. Because I got my opinions too. I think when I was on the zoning board, I had some suspicion about really, you know, it's just, hey, money want to take over Flint. I follow money. <laughs> Downtown, that's a lot of money going down there. I worked for General Motors for 32 years. General Motors ain't never did nothing without planning. So we all know that, people. So let's, we got to keep the pressure up so that our people that's put, voted into position will do the right thing. But really what we're down here today for is, like I said, we want to we want to get control back of our city. Hope we go to court, get Brown them out of here, keep that up, that other stuff that everybody wants is important, but as of right now, I think it's secondary. We need to go to court because that's how our system is set up. We don't lay down for anything, Josh. We don't lay down for anything, but I like your courage because like I was just telling a friend back there, he stood up and asked a question. Didn't none of us like what he said. Josh got guts. I don't, like, I don't really agree with all his politics, but you got guts. And I like a man with guts. We don't lay down. We appeal things. That's the way the system is set up. We know that uh, I ain't, I've been watching it on TV before my eyes went bad. I ain't seen our attorney sit here long. We all know the deal on him. We know, so let's get to action. I hope we keep this up. 
I'm glad to be back down there. I like this type of stuff, you know. And I'm mad at Eric. I want to know the record. I'm mad at Eric because he called all the important people. He didn't call me. I keep talking. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Gary Rustin. Mr. Rustin. Gary Rustin. He's left. Okay. Ms. Helen Saldano. Who? Helen Saldano. Helen? Helen Saldano. Okay. Okay. Lorenzo Avery. Lorenzo? Good evening. All right, good evening, City Council. This is my first time ever coming to a meeting. And, um, oh, you can't hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Just pull oh. it down just a little bit, Lorenzo, please. Do what now? Pull it down just a little bit. There you go. Is that good? Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank All right. Um, I've learned a lot today. Uh, it's been, I was already upset about a lot of things that didn't happen to my city because I was born and raised here in Flint. I don't know no other city. Uh, my saying was always to say, I'm born in Flint. You cut me, I bleed pebbles. I'm from the town of Bedrock. I love this city. And for what I didn't seen it happen, I, used to, I, I felt like whenever I would go on a vacation, I would say, I can't wait to get back home. And now I live on Fall Street. And I've been on Fall since 1983. And on the north side of my street, it's not a house occupied. I live in between Verdon and Harvard. And I said, a city lot hasn't been cut but one time. The grass gets so high, it's about, it gets about five to six feet. And then it, it kind of bend down a little bit. But it just, I got every kind of rodent imaginable. Skunks, raccoons, possums, everything is over there. And I'm like, I just, I, I was really kind of upset. Because a, a lot of people say a lot of bad things about Don. But a lot of things got done when he was in service. Um, the houses was, was getting, um, getting tore down. Uh, I had a lot across the street from me. He had a big truck, and they was over there for two weeks. He had some, like, some college students cleaning that lot up. That was the first time that lot had been cleaned. I know a lot of people might be upset because I'm saying something good about Don Williamson. But I'm giving credit where credit was done. I haven't seen a house tore down since they took him out of office. I'm wondering, is they going to ever start back uh, uh, tearing down the houses again? And then another thing, what I want to say, I'm retired. I'm on a fixed income. My water bill, the, for last, I just got my water bill two weeks ago, it was $201. Last month, it was $141. Then Snyder decided he wanted to raid my pension. I'm on a fixed income. I can't afford another penny. I need every dime I got to take care of my family. And I know a lot of people that's, that's retired in Flint. We got a lot. This is a, in this city, is a lot of people that work for General Motors and are retired. We can't afford any more. I can't afford another higher water bill. I don't know. And then what they're doing, I'm finding out it's illegal. And I am grateful to see the city council back. And I'm hoping and praying that Y'all come together and stop all the infighting that I've seen that, that went on for the last 20 years and nothing has gotten done. And I feel that's the reason why I come. Our, our city got took over by, by, the, by the city administrator. If y'all would have been doing your job, this would have never happened in the, in the first place. So now I'm praying. I can feel in my heart what they done did is illegal and y'all gonna get y'all jobs back, that y'all do your jobs and take care of our city and take care of us. I love, I love the city, and I want to get our police back. I want to get our firefighters back, and I'm just tired of all the fighting. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. <clears throat> Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Ms. Elizabeth, Ms. Elizabeth Jordan. Ms. Elizabeth Jordan. Good evening, everyone. Thanks evening. for sticking it out here. I know um, I'm in the back shivering, so only half in jest do I say, 
one way of saving money is to change the thermostat. Um, but uh, one of the things I wanted to, to just mention, you've already addressed tonight, and that was the importance of retaining and asserting the right to hold investigative hearings. Um, you know, I can, I, whether you agree to whether it was needed in this case or not, I certainly respect the, the right to, for the council to assert that. If we're going to believe in separation of powers and checks and balances, which of course is what our system of government is based on, having a legislative branch with that ability is absolutely critical. And so in the case where there's a, a conflict between the executive and the legislative, I'm glad that you're appropriately calling in the judicial. That's how our system's supposed to work. Regardless of what happens on election day, and I hope it's a good outcome, um, but the next day we're still going to have some difficulties as a city in terms of our finances. And so I don't want to, to minimize that challenge because it will exist and there's no magic one solution to it. But I do want to, to throw out a couple of ideas that might be worth considering, still knowing that we as a community are going to have to make some, some hard choices. But the key phrase is us as a community are going to be making those choices and not somebody else to whom they are not accountable to us. Some of those ideas in terms of looking at revenue sources, I think you've got to look systemically because it's not just Flint that's in this situation. We're further down the road than some of the other municipalities in Michigan. But the issue isn't simply local mismanagement. We all agree there's been some of that in the past. But the larger issue that's contributing to difficulties in Flint and Allen Park and Ecorse and Highland Park and a dozen other cities has to do with a revenue system that's broken. Cities can't rely on property tax revenues. We've heard people say tonight, I bought my house for 70,000, I can't sell it for 10. When you multiply that for an entire city, that adds up. A mill doesn't generate for the city what it did five years ago. Mm -hmm. And we have fewer residential improved properties because we have fewer people with houses on their properties. We've been demolishing them, not building them. So we have to think seriously about what can we do to advocate for new, effective, sustainable, realistic urban policies on a state level. And that means reassessing how we get revenue. So I don't want us as a community or as a council to lose sight of that need to do that state advocacy and to team up with people from other parts because it's not just the big cities anymore that are having these difficulties. It's a lot of medium and small cities and we need to join in common cause with them. Aside from that, I think that we do need to call attention to the role of process because as we make these difficult decisions, process matters. It struck me this evening when Councilman Kincaid said, please open the door, we need to have both doors open. It may seem like a small thing, but that's very symbolic. In a democracy, decisions are made in the open. People are accountable for what they say, for how they vote. People have a chance to weigh in. You may agree, you may disagree with what they say, but it's done in the open. The decisions that we've had made lately, whether you agree with the outcome of them or not, have not been made in the open. And that's something that should trouble everybody. Even if you think the towers need to come down, even if you think we don't really need CDCs, even if you could make a compelling case as to why there ought to be tax abatements downtown, people who advocate those positions need to defend them in an open forum. And I will say it's particularly dangerous, I think, when those decisions are not made publicly because you have an increased chance that they're going to be done in an inequitable way. As I said, you could make a case as to why there ought to be tax abatements downtown. You could also make a case for tax abatements to encourage business investment on North Saginaw or on MLK in Pasadena. But they're not made in public, so we haven't seen that happen, and I hope that changes. 
Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Jacob Yasemite. Mr. Jacob Yasemite. Good evening, Council. Good evening, Jay. How are you doing? Good. Good, I'm glad to hear that. The enemy of, me, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I have come here in support of you. Not you as people, but the idea of upholding our city charter, the idea of a city council, you know, representing the people. But um, I seem to remember that there was a day, I think it was September 12th, 2011, you guys had a consent agreement. And I believe the only people who voted against the, the receivership were Neely and Sargentson. Is that correct? No? Or, or, thank you very much. Okay, now you can pander to the voters all you want, you know, and you can like pull up the chains and stuff, but I remember when you put those chains on. That's all. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. The next speaker is Ms. Sharon Cheatham. Ms. Sharon Cheatham. She just left. The next speaker is Mr. Alex Harris. Alex? Mr. Alex Harris. Well, I'm glad most everyone's gone. Uh, I, I love to be a center of attention, but uh, I guess I won't be provided that opportunity. Alex, you're always center of my attention. Yes. <laughs> That's what I pay my wife to say. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I was just complimenting that uh, young lady, and young lady behind her, actually, did two of the most eloquent uh, five-minute dissertations I've heard in a while. But there's been very fine, articulate people that have spoken tonight, and uh, and I don't purport to be able to mention everybody or I even attempt to mention uh, anyone. But it uh, makes me think and reflect on the many years I've been knocking my head and fighting these causes and uh, not ashamed that I helped with some other people that I'm looking at to, uh, to kick out one bad mayor, a little small grassroots group that found out they could do something and actually pulled off something against what was uh, considered an insurmountable position and a powerful mayor that couldn't be thrown out of office. And actually, as far as I know, nationally, something that had never been done on a city of this scale. And then a few years later, is, uh, many of us were white, and that was a black mayor. But then a few years later, <laughs> amen. No, I don't, I don't regret that. But a few years later, then we had a corrupt and degenerate old white gentleman that became mayor. And he led this city into the follies, like Genesee Towers. Genesee Towers, direct result of his shenanigan. But you know what? Five minutes isn't going to cut it. And, and forgive me, and I said to my dear friend over on the uh, north side, the council seat, and I'm not defending Republicans. I voted Republican most of my life, no question about it. I'm not going to apologize for that either. But here's what I'm trying to say. Throw out your partisanship. Forget Republican and get Democrat. There's, we've been separated in this community so long by black and white and, and Republican and Democrat and demonizing one or the other or this person's affluent and this person's poor and this person must not be a nice person because they make a lot of money. These aren't the things that are American. And what I'm getting at is when you have a culture, a generation of poor municipal government. We had poor, poor leadership for a lot of years, my friends. Very poor. Forget whether they were black or they were white leading this city, because it's a mixture of both. And now we're in a situation where a very poor decision by what I think is a poor governor, 
but regardless of that, in appointing these people here are mostly Democrat. Now, not, that's not my point. But don't be fooled by, oh my gosh, the Democrats are the champions of this and the Republicans are the this or, or the conservatives or the liberals. My point is that there's a cabal of special interest, yes. whether it's uptown or with the acquiescence of the Mott Foundation or others, there was governors that were Democrat and Republican playing footsie. The guy who brought Ed Kurtz in originally, the guy who orchestrated, you know what he orchestrated, Mr. Kincaid. You know what he orchestrated after that mayor was thrown out within a few months. His name was Emerson. He's a tried and true Democrat champion of this area for years. He's been behind much of this. Tim Herman. These are people that make Tim Herman in a supposedly private sector uh, business is making over $200,000 a year. It's as much a private sector operation as uh, some office of state or federal government. But I'm straying away. What the sins of our own administrations of a generation or more don't justify adding and heaping more sins and greater evils upon this poor, oppressed community. Please, just a few more minutes. Is there something I'm going to read? But I want you to wrap up because there's still a lot more, there are a few more speakers. Is there? Yeah. Oh, I thought I was the last. No, no you're okay. not the last, Alex. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, not only do we know this guy makes more than the governor, 170000 I, of course, talk about Mike Brown. Not only do we have this new layer with Ed Kurtz and his benevolent leadership only taking in, what is it, 1000 a month or something? Oh, isn't that nice of him? Oh, pardon me. Probably right. Let me read a document that I, a, a, a good friend, and thank God I have some people that I know inside the city government that let me know this a few weeks ago, and I just got back in town today. But I'm gonna read this document, and I'll read it in, in a more succinct form, if you will allow me, Mr. Kincaid. This resolution to employ the services of Michael K. Brown as city administrator, dated August 8th of 2012, adopted August 8th of 2012. Pursuant to the authority granted the emergency financial manager by Public Act 72, the old public act that's now been revived. Michael K. Brown shall be employed by the city of Flint in the capacity of city administrator under such time as the emergency financial manager determines that his employment shall cease. Mr. Brown shall carry out duties as assigned and determined by the emergency financial manager. Mr. Brown shall be paid an annual salary of $170,000 paid in bi-weekly installments. I'll flip a lot of this and cut to the chase. These are perks that we weren't aware of that have been added to this already obscene salary in the most impoverished of communities, in the most dire need of help and fiscal responsibility. In addition to his base compensation, Mr. Brown shall be entitled to actual and necessary expenses related to travel, meals, lodging, incurred and connected to services for the city, and she'll submit original copies of receipts, blah, blah, blah. No. Number two, procure and maintain at his discretion and at the expense of the city, health insurance, life insurance, general liability, professional liability, and motor vehicle insurance. We're paying even his auto insurance. We're paying his mileage Alex, from his home in Lansing. Alex, come on. Come okay. On. There's some other speakers. So the bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, we just keep getting reamed and reamed and reamed to the point that we don't even recognize. And the last sentence I'll close with, there are a number of city administrator uh, or city uh, department heads and the like that are getting ready to retire and they'll be ushered into a new cozy financial settlement where they'll be paid a salary independent of their already existing benefits in retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have to leave? Okay. We've only had two more. 
We have two more speakers. Uh -huh. Okay, we have um, our next speaker. Mr. Frank Green. Mr. Green, he's gone. The, the last speaker is Jacqueline W. And I can't pronounce the last name because illeg it's illegible. I apologize. Mims. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good Thank evening. You. Yes. I'm uh, J. W. Mims, East Court, Jack area Jack citizen of Flint. Thank you. So Michigan. everybody can hear you. And I'm here simply to address the citizens of Flint and the city councilmen. Um, my opinions really don't matter, but I'm just here to say a few things. To the city council members who have, and I've been told none, have done a great job, but for those who have done your job, I'll applaud you, or I guess I'd say I could praise you, but I like to praise the ones who are gearing up and getting ready to do the job that you were elected to do in the best interest of the people, the citizens of Flint, Michigan. One other thing, for those who have not, I would suggest step down leave or simply bow out gracefully if there is such a thing among career politicians. For those who have gone before us, who have been in the trenches, in times like these, we need to do different things. The enemy is still among us. Those things that worked in 1968 and 1969 won't work today. I say they won't because the thing is, if the enemy is still attacking us, our defense should be different. So yes, investigative hearings are needed. And for Mr. Mays, I've been here before, sat back and listened, him telling you your job, to call people in, to put them under oath. I would say if I was running for city council position, I would find out what my duties were before I ran and run on that platform. For him to tell you your job and for people to say he's a hothead, I would like to use another word and even to describe maybe Mr. Cleves, a passionate person, a passionate person because of what's happening in the city of Flint. I am a 22 year member of the United States Air Force. And I would like to say coming back to the city of Flint with my house ready to be taken by Chase Bank, I'd like to say the good old boy system is still alive in the city of Flint. It did not leave when General Motors pulled out. It is still here. I've been told and the Lord did not give me the spirit of fear. I've been told that there are three or four men that own, or could we say run, or control the city of Flint. So all the words that have been said, why not come out and say them? Those men, if there's a woman, maybe they should be here. Maybe we should be addressing them and not city council because truly maybe they are running you if you cannot do your job the bible says study to show thyself approved a workman not needed to be ashamed you should be ashamed if you have not done your job for the citizens of flint and lastly to the citizens of flint from second kings i heard a lady say she was tired of hearing scripture i never tire of hearing scripture and from second kings the four leprous men that sat outside the city they said why sit we here until we die if we go back into the city of flint we will die there is no water if we move forward there is a chance our enemies may keep us alive. So citizens of Flint, there is a chance. In November, if you go out to vote, there is a chance you might live. Go out to the polls and vote November 6th. And vote no for the people who allowed to come into your city and ravish your city and take your rights from you. Thank you, City Council, for listening. Thank you.
Okay, that, that concludes our speakers for this evening. Uh, I don't believe there's any more resolutions. No more? Our next uh, city council meeting. Before we adjourn. Yeah, I'm not going to adjourn. Just let okay. me read that. Our next city council meeting and our schedules are for Monday, September 10th. Monday, September 24th, Monday, October 8th, and Monday, October 22nd. Uh, Councilman Neely. Um, yeah, I, like I, 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 I yield to Councilman Lawler first uh, so he can announce the, the resolution that was just passed for the investigative hearing. And then I'll. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and Councilman Neely. Uh, the investigative uh, hearing process will, will start. Uh, on September 10, immediately after following the uh, council meeting on September 10th after, at 5.30. So, just to be clear, if we have a number of speakers like we did this evening, we have to send out subpoenas to order people here. If we say at the end of the council meeting, it could be anywhere from 7.30 to 8.30 or 9 o'clock, depending upon, we had 40 speakers this evening. I, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just no, I, just, to, yeah, I understand. I understand. I'm, I'm just discussing. Well, you know, my recommendation, Mr. Kincaid, to this is that I'm we. I'm sorry? My recommendation to, uh, to that is that we will adjourn uh, the meeting at 7 o'clock, no, no later than 7 o'clock and then uh, start the investigative hearing if the meeting was to go to that particular time. That would be that, good. That, so we will suspend the meeting at that time and then go into the investigative hearing. So that would be at the September 10th meeting? That's so, correct. September 10th. So, so it's clear to the public, and I think we need to make sure we, we recognize this, that on Monday, September 10th, in our regular city council meeting at 7 p.m., we will suspend the regular council meeting and begin the investigative hearing. Right. And then, and then at the end of the um, investigative hearing, we will probably then um, adjourn the council meeting um, to the next meeting. So any speakers at that point in time would have to come back at the September 24th council meeting. Is that, 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 that is, is correct. That a fair assessment. Yeah, but I don't see. Um well, if we, if we conclude the meeting prior to 7 o'clock, is right. there a way can we start? We'll be fine. We'll be fine. Uh, but if we don't, um, I don't want people understood. That, that are here to speak have to wait till 10 or 10.30. I want them to recognize the fact that we're going to end the council meeting and then do the investigative hearing at 7 o'clock, which I think is reasonable. Understood. Okay. Yep. And in terms of procedure, I think we had a speaker talk about procedure and, and protocol as we go forward. We, we passed a couple resolutions tonight. My recommendation to this body is that procedurally we go forth as we would have absent uh, emergency manager uh, to, to forward them to the legal department, have them respond with an answer uh, very quickly. I do understand the orders that Mr. Kurtz put out about city personnel and city resources, but then after that, uh, we secure our attorney to go forward to the appropriate court to file the injunctive action and also to issue the subpoenas. Um, and, I, and I talk about procedures in this case, and Councilman Kincaid and Councilwoman Poplar were here. Uh, we had a, a few different cases um, that we had to go adjudicate over at the 68th, well, I'm sorry, the circuit court. Um, there is going to be a big conflict with Peter Bay as a city attorney here. Peter Bade also represented Uptown Reinvestment Development Company in the lawsuit for the Genesee Towers. He also represented Tim Herman in that same lawsuit. So it will be a conflict of interest, and the circuit court did rule in a previous hearing that when there's a conflict, they have a duty to assign us an attorney. Right. And I think we take that avenue first uh, as we go uh, procedurally. And, and Mr. President, if you don't mind, I would like you to share uh, previously at our last meeting, we requested a hearing pursuant to Public Act 72 uh, to have a hearing uh, before the Loan Review Board, and I think you were in receipt of a letter today, and if you don't mind, could you share that with the public? Yeah, I didn't, we, we did receive a letter, I'm going to ask the clerk to read it, I didn't, 
bring my glasses with me this evening, and it's in pretty small type. So we did re we um, passed the resolution a few weeks ago, um, and we sent a letter to the treasurer's office under Public Act 72. There's a 10-day period where you can appeal the emergency loan board's decision. So we drafted a letter. Councilman Freeman and, and I worked on a letter. We sent it over to Lansing along with a copy of the resolution requesting a hearing uh, before the emergency loan board which determined um, the emergency financial manager for the city of Flint. And Inez, you want to uh, read the letter for me, please? Sure. Uh, dear Mr. Kincaid, thank you for your August 14th, 2012 letters to Governor Snyder and State Treasurer Andy Dillon respectively. Your letters which concern the financial emergency in the city of Flint were referred to me for reply. In your letters, you requested a hearing to appeal the determination of the local emergency financial assistance loan board under sec section 15 of Public Act 72 of 1990, the Local Government Fiscal Responsibility Act. It should be noted that your letters misapprehend the statutory process. The local emergency financial assistance loan board made no determination under section 15 of act 72 or under any other section of that act. The board merely appointed a new emergency financial manager for the city pursuant to section 18 of the act. Section 15 of Act 72, like Section 15 of Public Act 4, the Local Government and School District Fiscal Accountability Act, authorizes the governor to determine, among other things, whether a financial emergency exists in a local unit of government. In regards to the city of Flint, Governor Snyder determined that a financial emergency existed and notified the mayor and the city council in writing on November the 8th, 2011. The governor's November 8th, 2011 notification also advised you of the statutory right within seven days of the notification to request a hearing regarding that determination. It is noteworthy that city officials, including the city council, declined to request a hearing. The deadline to have requested such a hearing expired on November 15th, 2011. And the letter is signed, sincerely, Fred Hedden, Director, Bureau of Local Government Services. And, and let, let me respond to this because there's, there's a couple of issues that, that I have with this. Under Public Act 4, uh, the governor appointed a review board, um, which included Former State Senator Bob Emerson, uh, he was a budget director for the state of Michigan. Uh, they appointed Darnell Early, who was um, city administrator, temporary mayor for the city of Flint. He was the city administrator under the emergency financial manager uh, from 2002 to 2004. That group of individuals completely different than the Emergency Loan Board under Public Act 72. And what they're saying is, is that because they had this appointed body under Public Act 4, which was appointed by the governor, which we all knew they were going to determine that the city was under financial stress, is a completely different body of individuals than those under Public Act 72. It, it's pretty clear the governor and the treasurer's office is, is going to do whatever they're going to do, and that's why it's so important that Public Act 4 gets denied um, in the election in November. It's our contention, and, and we all agree, that Public Act 72 is not in effect, that when Public Act 4 went into effect, Public Act 72 was repealed, and just because it's been suspended and put on the ballot, uh, uh, Mr. Dumas uh, read uh, uh, the uh, state Supreme Court's um, chief judge of the Supreme Court 
that even recognize the fact that Public Act 72 is not in effect. And I think when we appeal um, over in circuit court and we get that decision, that'll really help us uh, in determining where we need to go in the future. Um, we knew that when we sent this letter that it wasn't gonna get acted on by the treasurer's office. Those powers to be that are being controlled in this community and, and uh, um, individuals in the Uptown Reinvestment Group that have determined to get someone here, um, their influence is, is gonna outweigh anything that we do unless the court um, acts on Public Act 72. So, um, you know, we're gonna continue this fight. You know what's really interesting to me though, and I haven't said this publicly, and I'm, I'm gonna say it tonight, that when Ed Kurtz was appointed the emergency financial manager in 2002, Darnell Early was the acting mayor, and he made Darnell Early the city administrator. Darnell Early, African American, cut his pay to 92 or 93,000. Mike Brown was acting as the emergency manager. He appointed him city administrator. And as Alex Harris just read, he gets 170,000 plus a whole bunch of benefits. I mean, it really kind of shows you, um, you know, where this leadership downstairs, and I don't even want to call them leadership, but people in power are really focused on. They're not really focused on the finances of the city. And I guarantee you, the audit's been done. I said it earlier. The audit's been done. The numbers don't lie. When the audit's done this year, Mike Brown has created a higher deficit in the city of Flint than when he took over as emergency manager. And those numbers will come out real soon, and those numbers won't lie because they're done by an uh, independent auditing firm. And, and I'll be sure to remind everybody what that deficit increase is, and it's gonna be substantial. Um, any other council persons wishing to speak, Councilman yeah, Daly? Yeah, just one, uh, one more point. Uh, the previous refer referrals that I sent down to all the appropriate departments, Ed Kurtz said that they don't have to respond to them as right. a referral from this council body, but I would like my referrals trans uh, transferred to Freedom of Information Request as a citizen, and they cannot deny that. Uh, so I want all those same questions asked about the personnel contracts, uh, the amounts of money that's being made. We just make them uh, Freedom of Information Request, and we'll get our answer that way. Okay, I'll recognize those referrals and sort them. Anyone else? Thank you all for being here tonight, being patient. We appreciate you being here. We are adjourned.